Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth webinar in MIHA's Emerging Trends in Food Safety webinar series, Advancing Food Safety with Emerging Technologies. My name is Laura Wildey, and I am the Senior Program Analyst in Food Safety for the National Environmental Health Association. I'm joined by Taryn Laird, our Public Health Communications Specialist, and it is our pleasure to facilitate today's webinar. Please note this webinar is being recorded. If you are not okay with this being recorded, you may disconnect at this time. Thank you for joining us for our month long observance of National Food Safety Education Month. We are pleased to provide five free webinars to support our EH workforce this month. Each webinar will be recorded and housed on our Food Safety Education Month page. NEHA credential holders can self-report one hour of continuing education for each webinar viewed via the self-reporting feature of MyNeha. Also, for those of you who haven't seen our announcements about Food Safety Heroes, we are highlighting the outstanding work of our food safety professionals via our Food Safety Heroes blog. Food safety professionals across the world work tirelessly to safeguard the food we eat. To recognize a food safety hero, please tell us about them, and we will shout their praises via our Food Safety Heroes blog. We'll put these links in the chat for your convenience. This webinar is proudly hosted by the National Environmental Health Association. There are countless benefits to becoming a NEHA member. Connect with your peers, network, and get access to valuable resources and educational materials. We stand by our environmental health professionals who work so diligently towards a healthy environment for all. And if you're not already a member of NEHA, you can check out our website at neha.org to learn more. A bit of housekeeping before we hear from our speakers. All attendees are in listen-only mode. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. Throughout the discussion, you may submit any questions you have in the Q&A box, and we will do our best to answer as many questions as time permits. I'm pleased to introduce you to our panelists today. Let's learn a little bit about them before we dive in. Eric Moore is the Director of Food Safety and Industry Outreach at Testo North America. For the last 20 years, Eric has been a proactive leader in improving food safety programs at multiple industry-leading food service and retail organizations. Currently, Eric provides organizational leadership guidance for Testo and the food safety subject matter expert and as the food safety subject matter expert, and oversees external industry engagement, internal product design, and regulatory policy. Matt Jenkins works with the US restaurant food safety team at, the, at McDonald's, where he has been for the last two years. He has over 17 years of experience in the quality assurance and food safety field, spending the majority of his time within the food service industry. In his current position, he serves as a brand protector by helping to create, integrate, implement, and maintain an end-to-end -end food safety philosophy that ensures that only high quality and safe food is served to all McDonald's customers. Prior to joining McDonald's, Matt worked at Potbelly Sandwich Works, Sodexo, National Sanitation Foundation, and the DuPage County Health Department. A graduate of the University of Illinois, with both a Bachelor of Science in Microbiology and a Master of Public Health. He holds the following credentials, a Certified Professional of Food Safety, Registered Environmental Health Specialist slash Registered Sanitarian, Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point Certified Manager, and Preventive Controls Qualified Individual. Welcome, Eric and Matt. And at this point, I'll turn it over to you, Eric. Okay, thank you, Laura. While I bring my slides up here. And kick my video on. Where did the slides go? Oh, I was on the wrong one. Apologies, everybody. There we go. All right. Uh, so let me, uh, I'd like to first start by, you know, thanking uh, Laura as well as uh, Niha for the opportunity to 
be a part of this uh, this webinar during National Food Safety Education Month. Um, you know, really, really, really nice treat for me. Um, you know, to sort of give back to uh, an organization that um, you know I, I I've put a lot of uh, time and um, and effort into over the years uh, in maintaining my my credential uh, and my uh, in ensuring to follow my continuing education uh, path. So th again, thank you very much. So what I'd like to start with uh, is something that as uh, you know, food safety professionals is it, it, it's something that we're all, uh, we're all very well aware of, um, but I'd like to look at it in a little bit of a different, um, a different lens, right? And uh, it, it's, the, it's through the, the importance of prevention, right? Um, you know, for, for the better part of more than 20 years now, uh, the annual estimates for, uh, you know, foodborne illnesses in the United States have really stayed static, right? And these are, these are the statistics, you know, from, from the CDC, which everybody has seen probably several hundred times over the last year and a half with all the webinars and, and everything that people have done. Um, and what I what I'd really like to to, to focus on and share with with the, with everybody today is how I feel that technology is really poised to put some some legitimate dents in these numbers, um, which I think is is, is really important. Uh, obviously, it, you know, given the fact that I've I've dedicated my life to the public health profession as as everybody else here, um, and you know. Prevention to me is is the key ingredient in you know in this in this whole mixture, if you will, um, that technology is really showing and beginning to show its positive effects on being able to create safer, better work environments for both our employees and more, most importantly for you know, for companies, customers. So I think it's also, you know, important to, to, to share that, you know, whatever, whatever kind of, you know, tools or, or solutions you're, you're trying to, to work with and, 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 um, and integrate, you know, the importance of them being based in sound science is obviously extremely important, right? Um, but, but what is also really, really important is how technology can begin to help direct behaviors, right? And it's in the effort or, or with the ability of being able to direct those behaviors, there you know, should, in hopes, over a, a period of time, also have an effect of relative to cultural change, right? It, it can also provide some more tools to help create and support cultural change. But as you know, it, it's been said for the last two and a half years, um, you know, from, uh, from uh, Mr. Giannis with the FDA, right? Whatever tools that, you know, your role is looking to leverage and use, right? Again, the importance is they have to be science-based, right? It's got to be people-led and technology-enabled, right? So, in one of the one of the things that it, you know, I like to focus, you know, what what he begins to to speak about after he he leads into a conversation about that is technology isn't the answer, right? It's a tool. It's a fun tool, and it's a cool tool, and it's really it's nice and shiny. Right, and, and everybody's into it. Some people are, are hesitant, but it, it's a tool. It's a tool nonetheless. Just like, you know, when, when I was still in operations, log, paper logs were, those were a tool, right? They, they were a means to an end. And it, but in that, in, in that example, you know, these technology tools are enabling, again, I, I'm going to be somewhat repetitive here, more of a prevention based environment as opposed to a reactive based environment where which traditional food safety programs really really kind of encompassed 
So I'm going to jump back a little bit into what is the science right behind those illness statistics. And again, I, I know this is a lot of repetition that people have heard this, you know, countless number of times, but I like to, I, I like to lay sort of a baseline um, just going over, you know, what we all identify as food safety professionals and public health professionals as the, the five major foodborne illness risk factors, right? And the importance of, 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 of discussing this and bringing this up, right, is that in the, you know, for 20 years, the FDA and the CDC have been working together, developing these, you know, these, uh, these, uh, the food, the risk factor study that, you know, in starting in 2013, um, you know, FSIS inspectors uh, were, were going out and doing these, these assessments in, in retail establishments, asking questions that continued up until, um, I believe, last year or 2019, maybe. Um, in the results of, of, those, of those questionnaires, right, they, they show statistical evidence, right? The, the data indicates that establishments with defined food safety management programs are half, they, they incur half as many critical violations. And I know that's an outdated phrase, but I'm gonna use it just for, for easeability right now. Um, than those that don't have a defined program, right? And they, the, it, the study then goes on to further say, well, what is a defined program, right? It's a set of policies, procedures, SOPs that, all, that identify, you know, monitoring activities, as well as what types of corrective actions should be enacted after a critical limit is is breached, right? Or or something something happens. So, you know, one of the I think really really fun ways that I like to to try and talk about about this is, wouldn't it be cool, right? If there was a system that could bring all of this together and begin to provide a le some type of, you know, operational level visibility when all of these these risk factors, these top five, these five categories, when all of them are being effectively controlled, right? Pretty amazing, right? That would that was like Shangri-La in my in my mind, you know, you know, going back, you know, 10 years. <coughs> Pardon me. Well, that is exactly what technology is really able to do is provide a level of visibility into that type of you know program that active managerial control system that that we're all looking for operations to achieve right so so kind of gone are are the days when you would huddle around a clipboard with whether it be a shift manager a store manager a director uh whatever what have you and you know spending who knows how much time Going around, going around an establishment, writing down temperatures, and then reviewing them with people, you're able to create a more simplified and streamlined process where the system is taking the place of that activity, right? Um, so it's almost like you have another manager, right? That is, that, that is part of your program at every single establishment which I find to be just the whole concept of this just to be utterly, utterly intriguing and fascinating. But, you know, it's, I, I think it, it's, it's really, it's really there. And the, um, you know, the, the benefit of it, I think our industry and public health as adoption increases is just going to, to be shown by those those numbers, it, those foodborne illness numbers, you know, beginning to decrease, and hopefully the faster the better, right? Um, so how how do we how do we do this, right? Um, and actually, let me let me let me hit a, let me take one half a step back, right? Um, you know, I I know my perspective, right? It, the big difference between you know traditional food safety management systems and digital food safety management systems or technology enabled food safety management systems essentially is 
right? You're talking paper versus, you know, a tablet, a mobile device, uh, whatever, what have you, right? And I think a couple of the really, really big, big things that I'd like to, to look at are, you know, the traditional system is reactive, right? And somebody has to go and look for a problem, right? And that creates a, a kind of a punitive environment, right? That, you know, when I would go to, you know, a, a store, a location, a, what have you, I would say, all right, well, let's look at, let's review your, your whatever, your final cooking logs for, for the last three days, right? And, you know, now personally, I always, I always made a, you know, main attempt to, to, to have positive feedback as well as feedback for opportunities for improvement, you know, however, you know, that's hard to do, right? And, and it takes time to do this and it takes a person to go and actually execute that process, right? And having enough people to do that, let alone having enough people to, to fully operate a food establishment these days is extremely, is extremely challenging. So my hat goes off to everybody still in industry being able to effectively do that, like kudos, kudos to you guys. Um, those are just, you know, some, some of the, some of the things, right. It's, it's the, the, the good faith of, of putting your trust in all of your employees to always do all the right things all the time, no matter what, right. That's a lot of pressure, right. Um, especially again, with short labor challenges, right. New, new employees, you know, maybe they, they didn't totally court, you know, uh, understand what what they were trained in there you know as a new employee and they forget to do something or they forgot to check this or they improperly do that right there isn't that sort of secondary layer of 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 reinforcement or redirection outside of some printed directions or instructions on a piece of paper or there's somebody like looking over their shoulder which is completely unrealistic in 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 opera you know the current day society in food service. Now, in steps technology into this, into this paradigm, right? And with, you know, the use of, of mobile devices that you can program a system around taking active quantitative measurements around these five foodborne illness risk factors, right? whether it be hand washing or cooking temperatures or holding temperatures where were things delivered properly was the delivery vehicle in, in safe op, you know safe conditions et cetera et cetera et cetera right you start to you start to be able to to pull data into a system that is going to help you and the employees right that are actually doing this every day make better decisions right and the the other benefit here is that if and when there is some type of, you know, non-acceptable measurement completed, right, the system automatically jumps in and is able to redirect that individual, right, right in the, in the middle of that process to, as your corrective action procedure, to make sure that it is corrected, right? So, and that's what, this is a fun little, fun little animated slide that I try to, uh, you know, just provide a little um, visual context around, around what I mean is, is, is I'm trying to, trying to, you know, state that. So let, let's say um, Hector here, or Eric, is, you know, responsible for cooking poultry, uh, you know, uh, rotisserie chickens. And, um, you know, obviously the, the minimum required cooking temperature, 165 degrees, 15 seconds, uh, and he interacts with his mobile device. It's telling him, okay, take a temperature. The temperature is, we'll say, it's just greater than 165 degrees, right? Okay, so the system is going gonna, is gonna to communicate in real time with that employee, right, to say, hey, great job, okay? Good work. You get a gold star, right? Positive reinforcement, right? Um, which is which is good, right? Like that's really good. Uh, everybody, I don't I don't care what your role is within any organization, you know, positive reinforcement is one of the most valuable things that that you can receive, 
and that can be provided, right? And to be able to provide, it's a, it's a, it's a tiny little thing, but it compounds, right? Like this, that mindset compounds over time that, hey, when I do things right, this thing is telling me that I'm doing it right. That's pretty nice, right? And that kind of gets back to, I, I think, the previous slide, the, the term gamification, right? That, that begins to, you feel good about yourself, right? Um, you know, in some organizations, they could, they could begin to, to create a positive reinforcement, um, you know, campaign around, you know, who does, who does the most right all the time or, or, or what have you. Right. But let's look at the other, the other, the flip side of that coin. You know, Eric here takes the temperature of, of his rotisserie chicken and it's below 165 degrees. Right. What, do, what happens now? The system, right, can automatically, you know, provide the individual with some type of visual disruption, right? Rather than them just looking at a static temperature on some, some, some thermometer, it's going to, something is going to happen, right? It could be audible, it could be visual, it could be a little bit of both that is going to indicate something is wrong, right? They, and, and it's going to kind of put a pause in the process and it's going to require that the individual, right? In this is where things can be customized, you know, for, for organizations, but you can have them maybe watch some type of, of very short, like 10, 15 second, you know, train re-education video, right? Or you can have them review some torts, like in this example, a cooking chart, right? But then the system also is going to be able to, to have the individual get redirected that you need to take this temperature again, right? You need to continue cooking and then take it again. And it's gonna track all of that. And then when, the, when Eric does come back and takes the temperature, hey, there you go. There's that, again, that positive reinforcement step, right? Where even though the individual did something wrong, right? They were, they were sort of, they were escorted through the process to correct it and then sort of given that, you know, that high five. Now, if you're if you're gonna measure those high fives, maybe that high five isn't worth as much as is the other one, but it's still it's still good that like they comprehended, right? There, there's a level of comprehension that 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 occurs, you know, that systems are helping to facilitate with individuals, regardless of of how long they've they've been working, you know, in a kitchen. Right, it can help. It can help really, really bridge some of those gaps. <clears throat> so, um, it, as I had indicated, you know, culture. You know, once you begin to start to influence the right behaviors, right, culture can you know sort of begins to follow suit because if you're influencing all the behaviors across an entire organization, right, that that is that is how you influence positive culture change, right. Now, typical culture, right? For as long as restaurants have been around, right? In, in, a, in let's say the modern era, right? These primarily in, have been what success is measured upon, right? Sales, customer satisfaction, labor, how, you know, do it with less, do it with less people, right? Your food costs, don't throw too much away. And I would say in the last 15 years, there's been, more focused, with, and, and, and rightfully so, and it probably will and should continue on food waste, right? But all those things have, you know, they've got metrics around them, right? You know when, when it's good, you know when it's bad, right? Why haven't we been doing this for food safety, right? On a daily, and I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about like metrics around quarterly, you know, third party or second party inspections or health department inspections. I'm talking about daily execution at the operations level on what is supposed to be getting done every day, every shift, every hour, right? We haven't done, people haven't been able to do that because they've lacked the, they've lacked the systems, right? And that's where technology is able to have, to bridge that, to bridge that gap, right? You know, you know, depending on on where you sit within an organization, you could have real time visibility into right the control around all of those five 
top foodborne illness parameters, right? And you can automatically know, right? You look at this screen, you know, okay, this, this is, for some reason, we're having a problem with hand washing. And hey, the details are a little, a little fuzzy here, you know, but let's just say that's the previous shift, right? So out of, out of eight instances, for some reason, almost half, like a, four of them, sorry, you know, were not properly done. There, there was some type of violation. What, what is that? And I can begin to rapidly identify what those problems are. Right. And how do we solve them? Why, why did they occur? And how do we ensure they don't occur in the future? Right. And, you know, what I, what I really like to, to think is that this, this really creates a different mindset, right. Where, you know, not just, you know, celebrating, Oh, you know what you had, a, you had a great food cost percentage, you know, the day before yesterday or, or this, this period weekend, um, or your labor numbers are perfect, right? You came in like 10 bucks under, you know, why don't we, we need to be celebrating the food safety components of the same type of, uh, of met, or I'm sorry, we need to be able to measure, right? That level of food safety operational execution, because again, that is how we're going to change those statistics, right? It's, it's being able to influence and, and create more streamlined pathways of getting the right things done in real time by the people that are doing them. So uh, hopefully I didn't, I didn't jump too, too much around, uh, around there, but that is gonna close out uh, what I wanted to, to share with everybody. And we are gonna transition over to Matt and I will stop sharing my screen now. And if I can figure out how to do that. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Well, thank you, Eric. Um, thank you, Laura and the Neha team for having me here today to uh, share with you what McDonald's is doing and kind of piggyback off of what, what Eric was just sharing. Um, next slide, please. First off, I'd like to give uh, a quick plug to our food safety and quality systems team. You know, we manage food safety and quality um, along every step of the food chain, and uh, we're here to identify the risks and, and ensure we have the systems in place to mitigate, prevent any of these issues from occurring. Um, I support the last two pillars that you see on the right there, the restaurant and the customer uh, on our restaurant food safety team. Next slide, please. So McDonald's is, I'm sure, very much like many other brands out there, many other restaurants out there. Um, everyone has some form of internal food safety assessment in place, right? We have several at McDonald's. Uh, over the next few slides, what I'm going to touch on is our daily food safety checklist, uh, which I'm, I'm sure many have uh, seen or many have uh, in their own uh, establishments. They're conducted many times per day, usually prior to a shift or a meal change. And they're really there to focus on critical food safety risk factors. Um, and those checks allow the restaurant teams to make sure that they're meeting particular standards, whether it be food safety or quality. Next slide, please. So why now for digital food safety at McDonald's? Um, there's a couple of reasons that I put up on the, on the screen here. Um, modernize. Um, our system was antiquated. It's old. It's paper and pen. It, um, you know, stacks of paper on the manager's desk, as Eric was sharing, it's, it's you know, from a, a consultancy standpoint, or even from a regulatory perspective, you're going in and looking at, you know, bounds and reams of paper, it's, it's hard to identify trends and, and analyze those in real time. Um, and even with paper and pen, it was a long time for the restaurants to conduct the checks. Um, we heard loud and clear from our operational partners and from our owner operator community that this needs to be more efficient and needs to be easier. Uh, that was one of the reasons. Um, again, simplification and flexibility, kind of along the same lines, um, but really, we, you know, at McDonald's, we have over a hundred different floor plans for our restaurants and our paper and pen daily food safety checklist was one static piece of paper. Um, so if a restaurant had different uh, coolers or freezer set up or even had a regional menu 
um, limited time offers, things like that. Uh, it wasn't reflective on our daily uh, checklist. So that was one of the reasons. Um, and this really allowed us, you know, moving into the digital space allowed us to customize and I'll kind of go into that a little bit. Um, with, you know, a tighter labor market, I'm sure many of you, many of you are aware of it or feeling it. Um, you know, our restaurant community said, we need to do, as Eric shared, more with less, right? Uh, and technology really is our enabler, at least at McDonald's in this space, to help accomplish that. And then the last piece there with continuous improvement, um, you know, our food, our corporate food safety team, uh, we tend to not go to the restaurants to look at these dreams of paper. We, we have operational partners in the field to help support that mechanism. And then we also have third party audits, right? But that was our only visibility into really are we completing the checklist at the rate we want them to and are, are they doing it properly? Um, so, you know, moving to a digital space as I'll share gave us incredible visibility into uh, areas of opportunity, our successes and how to celebrate or, or not each of those. Next slide, please. So who are we working with? Um, McDonald's, um, from a global perspective, we have uh, several several uh, partners that we can choose from, uh, Testo being one of them. So thank you, Eric, and your team for all that you do for our global partners. Uh, here in the US, we decided to work with uh, two companies, Jolt and Squaddle. Um, both have been active in the QSR space, digitizing checklists for, for quite some time. And both were extremely collaborative with our core digital food safety team at the corporate level. Uh, which was inclusive of our uh, a select owner operator community um, to develop McDonald's customized apps, right? Um, they have out of the box solutions and things like that, but really we needed something that was right for us and they were willing to work with us on that. And then finally, um, the, the, one of the tools that we use, right? Our pyrometer, uh, this is a MFT pyrometer put out by Emerson or Cooper Atkins. It's a um, needle thermocouple, which we need to use for some of our thinner hamburger patties. Um, it's National Institute of Standards and Technology Traceable for calibration. Um, it auto equilibrates, uh, which I'll share a little bit more why that's effective for our particular platform. Um, and uh, it's Bluetooth, uh, again, uh, specific uh, need for, for, this, for this platform. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is just an illustration of um, one of our vendors. This is, this is Jolt's uh, template, um, but really the Squaddle system works identically to it. It just has a little bit different look and feel. Um, and this example is just temping a beef patty. Um, so the, the Bluetooth pyrometer um, is stabilizing and it auto equilibrates, meaning you know uh, anywhere between 140 degrees and 200 degrees it has an algorithm built into the pyrometer where it's looking for temperature deviations and fluctuations. And once it settles on uh, what it feels is a stabilized temperature, the, it, it zaps that temperature over to the tablet and it's recorded. And then that particular, uh, the software um, locks that temperature, which is a huge piece on the benefit side, which I'll share in a second about integrity, uh, it moves to the next patty and the next patty and the next patty. It's very quick and efficient. Um, so the software also populates these temperatures and then it establishes through formula, formulas and or algorithms, whether it meets or exceeds the uh, food safety standards and the quality standards. So here on the right side, you'll see uh, a particular example. Um, and, and Eric touched on this a little bit, right? With icons and uh, audible alarms or some form of mechanism to say, you either did a good job or you have area of opportunity. So for this particular example, we cook um, our quarter pounders to 175 degrees, right? That is our food safety standard. Um, so for this particular piece, you'll see temp beef patty number two at 159 degrees. You'll see a Q and you'll see an SF. That means it fell out of both spec of the food safety standard and the quality standard. And what it does on the bottom is it uh, it, it auto fills if the, um, a corrective action is needed for either one, whether it be food safety or quality and food safety does take precedence in our system. Um, and it forces the restaurant to take that corrective action and continue to conduct runs until the parameters are met for both food safety and quality. 
Uh, so it's a really nice little, it, it, that, that piece is, is pretty slick. And you know, to Eric's point on the positive side, uh, this particular system gives you a, a nice little thumbs up icon next to the temperature patty if it passes. Um, so that, that's really nice. You get some positive and then some areas of opportunity from a, a reinforcement standpoint. And then, you know, we, we gauge, um, you know, completion percentage as a KPI for this system. And if you don't complete the corrective action or fix the problem, um, you don't get credit for completing that particular check that day. Um, and, you know, that's where the, the coaching side of things, as Eric was sharing, kind of comes in. And I'll, I'll touch on that in a second. Next slide, please. Okay, so some of the benefits that we're seeing from DFS, and I guess I should mention that we instituted this system uh, early, uh, Q1 of last year, and right now we have about 11,000 or so restaurants on it here in the United States out of 13,500 restaurants uh, that McDonald's has in the U.S., so we're, we're, we're almost to that 100% that mark. Um, the first piece I touched on a little bit was integrity. Um, the Bluetooth capturing of temperatures improves the accuracy uh, as well as the integrity of our recorded temperatures. Again, the auto equilibration of that pyrometer and then the software locking that temperature. Um, I'm sure many of you have been in circumstances where you go in and view a paper log and you see, let's just take example, hot holding as an example, and you see 140 degrees across the entire, you know, the entire chart for every single product. Um, you know that there's probably some concern there, right? Um, so this takes that out of it and we've, we're able to measure, you know, what our average temperatures are and things like that for particular products, which has been proven to be uh, a, a benefit as well. Um, one of the goals that we were setting out to, to do was to simplify this process. Um, we basically had, um, you know, uh, the checklist customized to each restaurant. So as the restaurants sign up to work with either vendor, Jolt or Squaddle, uh, they would say, here's the, how many coolers or freezers that I have. Here's my uh, regional menu. Here's the LTOs that we'll be offering. And we're able to auto populate their lists for them. Again, my operational partners call, you know, each restaurant is a snowflake, you know, right? They have little differences and they're all unique. Um, this system molds to that and allows the restaurant to become more efficient. Um, the other thing, the, um, as I shared, the software goes from patty to patty um, or uh, other risk factor to, to, to the next task list automatically. There's time savings there. Um, I, you know, you hate to look for seconds or minutes, uh, but operations, that's what they're concerned about, right, is seconds and minutes and how that compounds over day, week, month, year. Um, and this really does do that for you. Uh, and that kind of goes into the next benefit, which was time savings. Um, our partner shared and we, 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 we viewed and our owner operator community shared that this is at least 15 minutes a day labor reallocation. I need to be careful by saying not labor save because it, that person's just going to be doing something else, right? So it's, you know, labor reallocation and it really allows uh, that manager to focus on running the business uh, in addition to managing the food safety systems and the operational systems. Um, continuous improvement. Uh, so, you know, with the reporting that technology gives you, rather than looking through reams of paper, um, you know, aggregated big data allows managers and owner operators and even the corporate food safety team to see trends. Um, and with trends or even at the micro level of the restaurant, the general manager can certainly share um, with you know, saying, hey, what happened here yesterday? Or what happened this week with shift A, B, or C? And you can go to those people that were conducting those uh, lists and say, let's work on this, right? So you start to see behavior modification, behavior change, and that ultimately leads to continuous improvement. The other piece that was nice with this is that we initially loaded our, di our daily food safety checklist as well as monthly. And the monthly looks at more systems-based um, checklists, not necessarily the day-to-day -day activities. Um, and once those were successful, restaurants started loading up operational checklists like uh, shift management and travel paths and all of these, you know, checklists that ask the manager to walk around the restaurant, identify areas of opportunity and or successes, troubleshoot and take corrective action. So inherently, you're getting that active managerial control 
because the system is making you do it, right? Um, that gets up and, and get out of the office and, and here, use this as your guide. Uh, and in each of these, if you do notice a non-conformance, you know, for us at least, uh, we have the troubleshooting steps embedded there, what to do, how to do it, et cetera. Um, one thing I, I'd like to mention on the celebration side of things, because now that we, we have big data, we're able to share across um, all, all of our field offices. And the field office is geographic, but they have about a thousand restaurants per field office. And a little competition starts, right? How are we doing? What the completion percentage is? How are we doing on beef? How are we doing on chicken, et cetera, et cetera. So it's nice in that regard. Um, this system, while not mandated today, will be mandated for all the remaining 2,500 restaurants that aren't on it yet at the end of this year. So that will be a system um, uh, requirement moving forward. Next slide, please. So with the remaining time, um, I'd like to talk about the next phase of our, our, of our digitizing food safety management, um, which is you know, remote temperature systems. And I'm sure people have heard or seen or, or uh, have some familiarity with this process. Really, it's a sensor in a cooler that monitors 24 seven. Uh, a couple of unique things about our system. Um, uh, we're using a, a LoRa WAN uh, bandwidth rather than Bluetooth. We found that to be more successful in our restaurants to transmit a signal more appropriately and uh, connect more, more often. So the sensor takes all this data, puts it to a hub or a gateway in the restaurant. The gateway zaps it to a cloud. Cloud spits it to the a digital food safety tablet promoting alerts and subsequently corrective action. And you'll see just an example of, of a graph of 24 seven monitoring there at the bottom. Um, so the sensors capture ambient temperature. They're taking the air temperature. Uh, we worked with our partners to develop a, um, uh, a heat transfer algorithm or heat flux uh, algorithm that mimics food. So it's actually mimicking about an eighth of an inch on the outside of food because that we know is going to react more quickly than perhaps a block of cheese three inches in. Okay, so with that, we're, we're not getting alerts all the time because a door was opened. It's when food starts to exhibit beyond uh, food safety standard thresholds. Um, also, with, what's nice about this is, you know, the alerting is, is certainly nice when you have a cooler that might be going down. Uh, you could take action before something does happen. Um, but this is integrated into our daily checklist as well. So instead of having a manager uh, walk around to each cooler, probe a product, write it down on the list, it's a one button, collect all the data from all the refrigerators and freezers, input it into the, into the checklist. It tells you if you need to take corrective action or not. So that's been a, a, another time save and I'll go into that in a second. Um, we're currently in test with um, these two sensors and uh, hoping to make general availability to the system in Q4, so really soon. We've had um, some, some really good feedback on it and we're really excited about it. Uh, next slide, please. So benefits here, uh, a lot of the same benefits that we were seeing with DFS, labor and time savings. Instead of walking around to each cooler and probing a product, this is a 15 minute labor save, right? Or a labor reallocation, I'll say again. Um, for the owner operator community, as well as for brand protection, and certainly for corporate food safety, this is a peace of mind piece of technology. It's monitoring 24-7. Um, for Again, for the restaurant level, inventory insurance, right? We're not selling steak and lobster at McDonald's, but there's still monetary value in measuring the, what's, it, what's in the cooler and taking action before something goes wrong. Um, energy savings. You know, we found in tests that our freezers, in some cases, are at minus 20 degrees. They don't need to be that. And that in, in fact, that's probably degrading quality uh, or a refrigeration, we're finding 32, 33, you don't need that. So, you know, every little bit helps. Um, so if you can set it at 36 degrees instead of 32 degrees, you're gonna get savings over the course of a, you know, day, week, month, year. Uh, and that's certainly beneficial to the restaurant level. And then maintenance and repair decisions. Um, our uh, Jolt and Squaddle, uh, who we're working with on this as well, you know, they're looking at predictive analytics. We're looking at compression cycles. Are they getting longer, shorter? Is something going wrong mechanically to, that we can alert the management team to say, hey, this is data that you didn't have before, right? Make an informed decision on whether to repair said piece of equipment or just replace it. You're gonna be better off that way. So those are some of the benefits that we're seeing now. Um, 
Next slide, please. So just to wrap up, you know, I think technology, as Eric shared, um, you know, there's there's goods and bads with everything, but on the whole, we're becoming more informed as a restaurant and as a brand on what we're doing well and what we're not doing so well. And at least we're able to make those actions, right? In the past, we may not have been able to do that. Um, just like every uh, restaurant or, you know, if it's, if it's a local restaurant or if it's a brand, you're taking data and making informed decisions, um, whether it be really, really small bits of data, like, you know, uh, a health department inspection here or there, customer complaints. Um, here, we're working with millions of data points to make informed decisions um, from a brand perspective and even the restaurant as well. Um, so with that, I see continuous improvement in FSMS, right? Inherently, because you have more data at your disposal to make more informed decisions. Um, and then active managerial control. Um, to, for, for us, you know, it's really looking at you know, that's okay. You could go to the next slide. I'm almost done. I, I'm, am I getting the hook already? Um, <laughs> uh, we're really looking at, you know, having the manager walk around, almost forcing the managers to walk around, observe, record, take corrective action and troubleshoot where necessary. And the more often we could get them to do that, the more ability they're going to be able to manage food safety and operational systems. And that's all I had. I think we're going to move to the Q and A section. Great, thank you, Matt, and thank you, Eric. Um, what interesting presentations on behavior and technology and using it to your great benefit. So, I we do have some questions on the board, so I'm I'm pleased to get to those, and I'd uh, like to start with this first one here. Um, as a reminder, anybody can submit questions in the Q and A box, and we'll answer them live. Uh, so the first question for you, gentlemen, is where should a company start when looking into technology to support their food safety program? Go ahead, Eric. Uh, that's, I mean, that's a good one. Um, <clears throat> I guess my, my sort of reply to that always is uh, leadership commitment. Um, because it, it doesn't matter what system right, you're talking about, they're not cheap, right? And what is going to be triggered is a, is a fairly in-depth change management initiative within an organization that is going to have, you know, sort of splinters and tentacles into other departments. It's not, this isn't just food safety, right? It, it, it's gonna require IT, you know, investment, time, commitment, finance, investment, time, and commitment, um, in, as well as like supply chain logistics and getting things, you know, devices and things. So just making sure that, that there is strong commitment to see the process through. And I, I'm sure Matt can attest to this. Like it, it you know, it's one of those, those things, like it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. Like, <laughs> you're not going to be able to do this overnight, right? Um, it takes time. Um, and and that, that's going through like testing to, to then transitioning, you know, evaluating various, various vendors, then through implementation, training and rollout. Like it, it, it's, a, it's a big deal. Yeah, and, and I'll piggyback. I mean, what Eric shared is the journey that we went through, right? Uh, you can imagine 13,000 plus restaurants in the U.S., this is a long process. We, we're, we can't flip on a dime. Um, but what I would say, I think, is to, to start is to listen, right? As a food safety professional, you may say, yeah, we need this, that, and the other thing. But if the restaurants aren't saying we need that, you're not going to get it to go all the way through to the end. So if the restaurants and operations start to say, we really, really can use your help pushing the needle here, um, and then you go and get leadership buy-in and they're supporting you with that, then you can start to move the mountains that Eric was sharing that you go through the testing process and you go to, you know, see it all through. But I think without the restaurants and, and the restaurant teams or operations supporting what you're going to do, I think it's going to be an uphill climb. So I would make sure that you're listening is, 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 my, is, my, is my note. That's a great point. 
Great, thank you. And while we're on that, the, the teams that you're that you're working with, I have some questions on the board about um, some challenges. So the first question is, what are some of your technology challenges that you've faced with employee training specifically? Oh, man, I'll let, Matt, I'll let you. <laughs> Um, well, with, with the technology training, it's a culture change, right? Um, there are um, a lot of, from a demographic standpoint, you're working with all sorts of different people. Some people love paper and pen and don't want to ever let it go. Um, so that's a, that's a challenge and it takes time. And, you know, really what we saw with, with digital food safety is it almost takes a good 30 days to work through the different crew uh, to get familiar and comfortable with what it's doing. Um, for us, uh, with, with, with our checklist, you know, we're asking managers to do it. Um, so for the most part, um, you're training a, a, a subset of people, right? Uh, rather than the entire organization, which can take some significant time. Um, but that, that would be one. Um, the other, you know, I, I noticed one of the questions talking about uh, audible alarms. Um, if you've ever been into McDonald's, it feels like you're getting sung to because there's so many audible alarms that are going off. So really differentiating what that alarm might like look like. Uh, and to Eric's point in his presentation, there are things that uh, trigger or lock you out or look different on a screen when you're looking at it rather than just an audible alarm because it starts to sound all the same. Those would be a couple of quick, quick ones I would point out. Yeah. And it, I, I can, I can just, I can talk to a study that, um, that it's, it's still ongoing, but that I've been part of um, a university study that uh, one of the biggest, I would say like challenges, it, it wasn't demographic. It was, um, and actually the demographic findings were, were opposite of, of what at least I went into, you know, the beginning of the study thinking that older demographic individuals would be more, more, you know, apprehensive and it was actually it was the opposite um but but the most startling thing was people were reluctant to um to begin to uh, you know begin using it because they saw that my 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 daily activity is being tracked right so it's kind of like that big brother thing and but here i guess Here's what I always like to, to say as a footnote to that. If somebody's concerned about that, then they're probably not doing what they're supposed to be doing anyways, right? And now they, they're, they're, they see that, oh, crap, somebody's going to be able to tell that I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing when I'm supposed to be doing it, so I'm going to be held accountable. So that was, that was something that I found to be, you know, interesting from a, like a study, you know, a research study perspective, um, but also, you know, kind of not surprising, even, you know, even in paper-based systems, you, you have those challenges, right? Like it's the same challenge, it's just a, it's just a different format. That's, that's very interesting. And let's, let's keep on that people focus for a minute. I have a question on the board um, that I'm going to reword a little bit, but the start is, isn't taking people out of the equation a little bit risky? And I think when this person is saying taking people out, and you know how these automated systems that are looking at interior temperatures, is that going to make a person steer away from taking that internal temperature? They already have an automated system, so we don't have to worry about it. What are your thoughts on, on that? And is, is this a help? Is this a hindrance? Or what about this road that we're going down? Do you mind if I start, Eric? Yeah, I mean, for, for, for me, um, I think it's a, it's a people-led, you know, process that is assisted by technology, right? Um, you know, these things are there to make that process that is led by people easier and more effective and efficient. Uh, for, you know, for us, for example, um, the, the, you know, the trending analysis and managing and monitoring what those reports say are still read by people. And those people still need to go back and work with their restaurant teams on behavioral changes. So to me, this is, and I shared this a little bit in the presentation, is that the data is informing the restaurant managers on how to better coach their teams and how to better and in perhaps even more efficiently work that process. 
So I don't feel like you're taking the people out. I think you're giving them better tools. You're, you're going from, you know, a jalopy to a Lamborghini in some regards, you know? I mean, you're, re you're, really, you're really trying to elevate what information they have at their disposal to make a better informed decision for the restaurant. Yeah, and, and I'll kind of, you know, if I can add, add to that, and, um, you know, I think, Matt, you, you, you already called part of this out where, you know, what is, what you guys are, are using in the U.S. is, you know, you're using ambient temperature with an algorithm that is mimicking internal, you know, internal temperature. And then when that problem is flagged, right, the way the systems are programmed, right, it's specific decision makers, right, are notified. Correct. And because there, there's no real noise in the system, like when they get that notification, it's like, okay, I, it's time to, you know, the bat, the bat signal is shining. I need to go, I need to go figure out what's going on, right? And, um, you know, it, I would say, there's also a, a layer, you know, depending on how an organization, you know, would would sort of script out, you know, their uh, their corrective action protocols. You can always add some type of actual verification with a thermometer as part of that process. So, it, you know, in I, I would say that can even, that can be updated and changed at the drop of a dime, which is another huge benefit of these systems is, is their flexibility in being able to change and adapt to different and varying regulate regulations or, or problems, right? Like what the world is still going through now, unfortunately, um, you know, but being able to adapt to those things, um, cause you could start out like everything's got to have a, have, you know, some type of, of, product temperature if if an alarm goes off and then over time as as the organization becomes comfortable with the the uh, the system's functionality and accuracy you can start to scale that back based on evidence right i hope that answers the person's question i think so and and i think we have a time for one maybe two more but we'll see how this next question goes uh, the question is, how do your efforts connect with FDA's new era of smarter food safety? And what would you like to see FDA do to support the industry efforts to modernize food safety? Well, I'll, 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 I'll take it quickly here from my end. Um, you know, from a McDonald's perspective, you know, this has been several years in the making, but we're digitizing the supply chain, right? Uh, so there's Herculean effort going on behind the scenes about, you know, from farm to the back door on what's happening there from a digitization perspective. I do feel like what we're doing in the restaurant is helping to support FDA's mission to do that. Um, I don't think it's just technology based, but I think that's a large component of it. Uh, but I do feel like um, not my world, but, you know, uh, behind the back door to the back to the farm is happening from the McDonald's perspective, but I'll, I'll let Eric go because I know he uh, touched on that in his presentation a bit with Frank. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would I would echo, you know, what, what Matt is saying. I think, you know, from the, the supply chain um, management and traceability component, I think is, uh, is, is becoming pretty clear. Uh, the traceability rules that, um, that, that are in place now uh, and access to records and, and things like that. So once that rule is finalized, that kind of creates the script that, that you know, industry and uh, technology providers need to follow, uh, you know, for, for retail and food service establishments. You know, all I can say is that um, the FDA uh, submitted a, an issue at this past year's uh, conference for food protection um, to, uh, to create a, um, um, a committee to work on uh, putting some um, some structure around, you know, or putting some, making it more clear what a what a what a defined food safety management system is and what what is comprised of that. Um, I actually also submitted an issue at CFP that got accepted to um, to put together a uh, 
a, a committee to work on the digital food safety component of that. So I, I think with those two types of, of committee groups uh, moving forward, I think there becomes a, a you know, a good opportunity uh, for them to, um, to, to work almost kind of in parallel and, and together in some regards to start to, you know, figure out, all right, well, if you're an industry organization and you're doing this, what can and are you willing to share with regulatory? And if you're a regulatory, what do you want to see and how do you want to see it or have it provided to you? Like those are the kind of things that I think will in short term come, come of those activities. Thank you both. And, and what an interesting conversation. And I, I hate to cut it short, but we are nearing the end of our presentation today. Uh, before we go, I'd like to remind everyone that the next webinar on Emerging Food Trends webinar series is coming up next Tuesday. I hope you will join us to learn uh, more about technology and using it for food safety uh, practices and education at retail. So uh, we'll drop the link to register in the chat. It's actually on the Mihas Food Safety webinar page. So I sincerely thank you, Matt and Eric, for your time today, your valuable insights. Of course, thank you to the audience, the attendees for their time and participation and their dedication to food safety. Thank you so much for being here. Don't forget to nominate your food safety hero for our Food Safety Heroes blog, and we'll see you uh, next week on Tuesday. Thank you all, be well. Thanks.